All right, you're live. Thanks so much, David. Uh, appreciate it. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Tanvir. I would like to extend a warm welcome to all of you for joining us for the Hyperledger meetup that we're doing virtually. Uh, we do um, several meetups that are in-person, but we do a lot, lot more meetups that are virtual and it allows us to um, get speakers who are in other parts of the world, uh, like David Palmer. Really appreciate uh, David joining us. Um, he heads the um, uh, the blockchain uh, group at um, at Vodafone. Um, he is um, uh, widely followed on across different uh, social media platforms. Um, uh, speaks a lot at some of the top blockchain events and, and conferences uh, globally, um, and also is an evangelist for you know within the Web three space. Um, so we're very excited to have uh, David join us today from London, um, and I'm here in in San Jose. So David, uh, welcome welcome to our uh, meetup uh, uh, today's meetup. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, great, great, great to be on uh, in in this meeting, Tanvir. Uh, yeah, really excited to have this conversation. Um, I was I was in San Francisco in June, uh, so I was in the Bay Area in June. Really loved it. Uh, so I feel like I'm coming back home. Right. <laughs> yeah, that, that was actually a good conference, the the Blockchain Expo North America. It, it was nice to see you on stage in uh, you know different sessions, David, and uh, uh, and I really appreciate you. You know, when I, um, I invited you, uh, you know, I was very excited that you agreed to um, you know to join us. Uh, there's you know a lot of great things we'll be discussing, mainly around how global brands are leveraging Web three and the metaverse either for business transformation, to create competitive differentiation, et cetera. Um, when we have some time later on in the chat, we'll also like to talk about the, the book that you've written uh, and ah. hopefully get some details on, um, on, on, on all of that. Um, but before we go there, uh, just for the audience to get to know you, David, um, uh, yeah, your, your role, uh, tell us a little more about you know, what are some of the things you're doing at, at Vodafone and what specifically attracted you to the blockchain space, right? How did that happen? Uh, so, 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 yeah. I, I mean, I've, I've I've been in blockchain Web three for 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 many years. So, so I started looking at Bitcoin uh, when it was uh, not fashionable. Fashionable when we were all crazy, uh, trying to mine it on our hard drives, <laughs> uh, and uh, and uh, really got got excited uh, with Ethereum. Uh, so, so, so um, you know, started. Uh, you know, trying to to program smart contracts uh, many many years ago. Um, uh, you know, with, with with Ethereum, I'm still a big, big uh, believer in that. Uh, but but now, uh, you know, in my role, um, sort of look helping Vodafone look at uh, blockchain and Web three. Um, you know, use a lot of platforms, Hyperledger, uh, a number of the Hyperledger uh, platforms, um, and uh, as well as some of the other blo uh, pro uh, public blockchains. But it's really looking at uh, what, what what attracted me uh, to it is the potential of the the technology to extend the the automation boundary, right? Yeah, just at its simplest level, um, you know, the ability to provide trust and transparency, uh, which you know is a use case that's supporting cryptocurrencies, but can be used for so many other um, corporate use cases. That was really attractive because it takes it to the other level. You know, we can have a lot of uh, automation internally. Uh, because we trust the organize, well, well, organizations don't even trust themselves internally, but there's enough there's enough systems and processes to be able to, to to have that. But externally, this is where you have credit checks, you have supplier checks, you have uh, you know so many checks, um, and the ability to have trust and automation, uh, you know, with that external uh, boundary with when you're dealing with external companies, is something that was finance, uh, which was um, you know I, I found uh, fascinating. Uh, so 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 really, you know, I was really attracted by what could uh, blockchain and Web three do for telcos? You know, what what could it do for roaming agreements? What could it do for IoT? What could it do for contracting? And that was really the start of the journey, uh, which led to um, a new platform being born out of Vodafone, which I am the chief product officer and co-founder of, called Digital Digital Asset Broker. Uh, which is about using Web3 precisely to extend that uh, automation boundary for IoT devices. You're know, expecting maybe in the next five to seven years, you know, any 100 billion, 70 billion IoT devices. Um, your smartphones are also devices. 
Um, but but uh, where those devices can trust each other across uh, organizations and ecosystem boundaries, uh, where they can uh, digitally sign using encryption, where they can transact using wallets and, uh, and tokens, you know, is essentially what the digital asset broker platform is about. Uh, and and we, we've used Web3 to provide that new age of automation. Um, so, so yeah, that, that's what I've been doing uh, for the past years. Um, and also very big, uh, taking that into metaverse, uh, taking that into broader Web three, um, you know, and, and and always looking for the next uh, uh, the sort of next um, evolution of of the technologies, which hopefully we'll we'll discuss today. <laughs> I, I can't wait to get to that. Um, you know, to set the stage, right? And, and and actually, before I do that, for those who are not familiar with Vodafone, they have a it's among the largest telecom providers or and wireless providers in the world. Um, I, you know, I looked them up, um, um, I read a little more about them. I think they directly operate in about 22 countries uh, and then through partners in another 48 different countries. Um, at one point, uh, Vodafone um, owned a, a big share of Verizon Wireless, which uh, I think is a big name in the U.S. So I, I worked for Verizon for five years in Southern California. Ah. Yeah, so I, I am an alumni and um, I have a lot of respect for the company, the brand, the network, um, the operational discipline. And um, also when I'm in India... I always use a Vodafone um, mobile phone, app, you know, when I land there. So uh, I, I, I am a customer whenever I'm, I'm in your markets. Uh, so I, I think it's, it's it's a phenomenal story of what, you know, Vodafone has accomplished. And now it's, you know, going beyond as we get into connected devices and, and you know, connected transportation and autonomous transportation and mobility. I think we'll, we'll hopefully, you know, get, get, get to hear about some of the use cases. Uh, but I want to start really basic. So if you have to explain, um, you know, Web3 and Metaverse to a business executive, right? How, you know, from your perspective, how, how do you explain that in, in a nutshell? Yeah, yeah. so, 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 so um, uh, difficult question. It's always hard to go to the basics. So, 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 so I, I would say blockchain and Web3 uh, is about trust. It's about digital trust, uh, about digital uh, asset ownership portability and transactions. Uh, and I would say that the metaverse um, is, uh, yeah, the, the, the metaverse, I'm, I'm not, I'm going to take a bit more time on, right? Because um, I believe that if we take the metaverse as its basics, we'd say it's uh, immersiveness. It's about a new immersive virtual reality, um, which uh, you know, allows us to do things that we can do in the real world, in the virtual world. But actually, it's a lot more. Uh, because uh, as I'll explain later, I believe that the metaverse um, will replace the web browser. I believe the metaverse uh, will be um, the place where people interact with content uh, and uh, where businesses interact with uh, the digital world. Um, and as as a new operating system, um, you know, which is going to feed the content to the people using, uh, you know, who use that new immersive web browser. Um, you know, it should be able to draw on a number of technologies, AI, Web3, ERP, Web2, uh, you know, to, to, to provide the right components for the right solution. Um, so so, so I, I would say, uh, you know, to, to, you know, a business executive that the metaverse is not just immersiveness, it's actually a new digital operating system, uh, which will allow uh, users, businesses and consumers uh, to uh, incorporate uh, you know, the, the uh, number of technologies into digital experiences. Super. Uh, th thank you for that. Now, last year, um, you know, there was so much of talk and a lot of hype around, you know, Metaverse um, and Web3. You know, Facebook changed its, you know, stock sticker symbol in June, I believe. In October, they rebranded the whole company as, as Metaverse. This year, you know, some of that um, buzz may have, you know, that hype may have died. But I think we actually seeing companies, you know, you know, making progress and, you know, um, bring that utility or adding, you know, creating that value. Um, uh, what, what are, the, you know, the, the, the big use cases that you are most excited about um, right now? Yeah, uh, so, 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 so you're absolutely right. Last year, uh, or 2021, um, you know, the metaverse was at the top of the hype cycle, and we had all of the usual suspects coming out and saying, okay, it's going to be a 15 trillion opportunity. It's going to be a 5 trillion opportunity by 2030. Uh, so we had a lot of big forecast numbers. Uh, this year, of course, the uh, the headline has been chat GPT, uh, open AI, generative AI. 
uh, 100 million followers in six uh, 100 million users in six weeks and uh and it's taken over but uh actually you know as i said i just repeat my point um you know the metaverse and ai are linked the metaverse and web3 are linked the metaverse and web2 are linked right uh as, as you accurately said uh you know facebook changed its name to meta uh, they've got the potential to bring billions of uh of, uh, of people to 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 the metaverse right so so do apple uh, but apple are creating their own metaverse um so 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 web 2 will be will, will be very important um so 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 in terms of the the hype cycle um you know the success of ai will be the success of the metaverse the success of, success of web 3 will be the success of the metaverse i mean if we go back to some basic stats and we look about where the adoption of these new technologies are going to come from. Um, you know, population by 2030 will be just over 8 billion. Uh, the, the penetration of mobile phones globally uh, will be near 8 billion. Right? So you're talking, you know, everyone who, you know, I think they'll start issuing, issuing mobile phones to babies when they're, when they're born, right, in the, in the operating theater. Um, you know, uh, you know the majority of the world now have a have a have a smartphone. Um, what's really interesting is uh, is at the moment there's 4.5 billion digital wallets, uh, and by 2030 we're expecting 5.6 billion digital wallets. Uh, so if you look at the things that uh, the, the, you know, that that have uh, and uh, social media over 4 billion, it may be approaching 5 billion pretty soon. So if you look at the things that have penetration right in you know in, in the world, it's the mobile phone, yeah, people increasing mobile phones increasing social media medium wallets those are the things that have got uh, penetration if you look at web3 uh, amount of digital wallets is, is just 300 million to just over 300 million right so it's nowhere near the penetration of wallets nowhere near the penetration of social media uh, nowhere near the penetration of smartphones so that indicates to me uh, that if the metaverse is going to get adoption if web3 is going to get the adoption it's not going to be with each other it's actually going to be, uh, you know, uh, where, where where there's a convergence with the smartphone, uh, where they're converging with uh, with fintech and wallets, uh, and where they're um, converging with social media and web two platforms. Right, initially, and that's going to be the initial phase. Um, so, so it goes on to come to your question about what are the use cases I'm excited about, um, you know, with 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 the metaverse. I, I, I think there's some really exciting stuff happening now. Um, I, I, you know, on, on LinkedIn and other platforms, I keep getting these snippets of, you know, AI writing code and uh, AI generating uh, film content, etc. Um, and actually, uh, I, I believe that um, that for AI uh, to have a presence on this app, for us to be able to interact with it, for for the for AI to be at the end of a web browser with 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 dynamic prompts, not just voice or, or text uh, in an interactive way, uh, that AI is going to have to take on a persona and environment which will be provided by the metaverse. So I, I, I describe the metaverse as AI on Earth, right? It's, it's going to be how these 300 million jobs, which are lost and replaced by AI robots, we're going to interact with them on the metaverse. And that, that's why that metaverse as a point of interaction, as the touch point, uh, is such an important thing. So in terms of use cases, I, I, I think some of the use cases in film, uh, I think some of the use cases in virtual showrooms, uh, I think some of the industrial metaverse use cases uh, in terms of digital twins, um, I think some of the retail use cases which are linked to showrooms, et cetera, are, are really exciting, but I believe they're only the beginning because I believe that the use cases that will come are where we start to mesh these uh, these technologies. So you mesh the metaverse with tokens, you mesh the you, you mesh the metaverse with AI, you mesh it with Web two, or 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 a, or a combination of all of these, and that's where we're going to start to see some dynamic um, use cases. Just going back to your point on the hype cycle, you got to remember where we were in 2021. Uh, we, we were on the back of being at home for two years, right? Uh, you're on the back of a pandemic. And of course, being at home for two years, it's like, okay, what can I do uh, virtually, which I can't, which I cannot do physically, I can't go out, I can't go to a party. So let's have a virtual club. Uh, let's have virtual, virtual socializing. And what we've seen now, uh, post pandemic, you know, we, we, we were told that nobody would travel again, or not many people would travel, not many people would go to conferences selling out, right? Uh, people are now enjoying physically socializing, right? So, so, so this idea of a 
of a all encompassing metaverse um, that would replace the real world. Uh, and, and it would be this big persistent uh, thing like the Matthew Ball definition, I think is dead. Right? I, I honestly believe that's not going to happen right now. I, I think where we are with the metaverse right now is that we will have several mini verses, right? You'll have the Apple metaverse, you'll have the meta metaverse, you'll have other metaverses that will spring up. And then in order to get dynamic journeys and portability of identity and ownership and all the rest of it across it, you'll start to see some interoperability. And then eventually down the road, you may see some convergence. Um, and, and, and I think that's, you know, that, that's important in terms of realizing, uh, you know, the development. But um, in terms of use cases, I don't think you know, the metaverse will replace the physical world. It was never going to do that. I don't think that we want to do everything we do in the physical world in the virtual world. It's going to be where it adds value, where it adds value from an entertainment point of view um, and where it adds value from a, a business point of view. And and in my, in my book, I'm, I'm, I'm pre <laughs> I, I map out a feature set, right? So so there's two features in particular um, that, 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 that I use to... So I've got this uh, business opportunity quadrant, and there's two features that I map on on, on that quadrant. Uh, one is the um, added value of immersiveness, and the other one is the uh, uh, the added value or the benefit of removing geography, because two of the key features of the metaverse is it removes geography, uh, and um, it, it can bring um, a level of immersiveness um, that that you wouldn't otherwise get. So, so when you look at those where you have um, you know high 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 benefit from immersiveness, and you have high benefit from removing geography, those are the sweet spot use cases. Some of the examples uh, that get me excited are education. Um, if you look at uh, you know th there was some study I was watching it could have been it could have even been on on on, on one of these forums hyperledger forums uh, but it was talking about um, the benefit of every child having a personal tutor and of course you can do that now with AI right it's, it's going to be possible you can have a you know, you can you, you you can have a lot of help but you know the the benefit of metaverse education where someone in deepest Africa or Asia or a poor place uh, where geography was a boundary, right? I can't physically get into the US. I can't physically afford to set up there. Is removed. And uh, the uh, level of immersiveness uh, is high because it's a course that involves physical touching that you couldn't do before. So you could do online courses, but you couldn't interact with your class uh, you know, in, a, in an immersive way. And you couldn't do medical procedures. You couldn't do engineering stuff in the same way uh, as you could now. But, but the metaverse now makes that possible. Uh, then I think you're in a position where um, you know, uh, the metaverse universities or metaverse training and education becomes really exciting. Um, and I, I think that's one of them that, uh, you know, that, that really excites me because it can bring about real change. It can actually increase the improve the productivity of the world, right? By making people uh, more productive and, and providing um, extending the the amount of education uh, that's available, or the opportunities in education. But there are others. I, I'm talking a lot. Uh, uh, I'll maybe <laughs> tell me, uh, uh, give you an opportunity to ask some questions. But uh, no, no, we'll 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 delve a little deeper into one yeah. or two use cases in a minute. Um, I love one of the things you shared. I follow you on LinkedIn and you put up some great posts. One of your articles you shared was how Bank of America, which is really surprising because banking is fairly, you know, they are slow to adopt. They're very risk averse, very highly regulated. But even a banking institution is now, you know, how banks, how, how banks are also leveraging the metaverse where they do their new higher orientation for bankers. Uh, and, you know, you can put on the, you know, the, the Oculus like glass, right? And now you can get simulation on, how to deal with the irate customer or, um, you, you know, like a bank robbery that's happening and, and how do you deal with that, right? I thought those are very powerful real life uses, um, you know, using uh, the, the uh, you know, the metaverse, right? Um, and uh, so when you spoke about education, I, I, I think, yeah, that's definitely a very exciting area. Um, I want to switch gears a little bit um, to see, now you, I think you were the ones who coined this whole thing of uh, the um, the um, economy of things, right? Um, yeah. So how did that, you know, how did that, you know, how did that happen? And then where are we now with with, with the economy of things, right? Uh, and we, I also want to learn a little more about what you're doing with, you know, uh, the, the the digital asset broker 
one use case, right? That where you feel that there's you know some real traction um, that that you can talk about. Yeah. So 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 the economy. So 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 as you all know, yeah. And I and I've been in this. Uh, uh, the sort of internet of things, machine to machine, a long time. So we we've, we've gone from machine to machine, to internet of things, and now we're talking about the economy of things. The internet of things is about connected devices, and and, and as uh, some of you may 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 know, you know Vodafone and companies like AT and T uh, and other operators, uh, you know, are leaders uh, in managed connectivity of devices. And the internet of things has largely been about connecting devices, connecting sensors. Um, you know, connecting cars, uh, connecting drones, connecting uh, cabinets, connecting street lights, and, and that has been the focus: connecting them. What what you'll find though is that um, there's a lot of investment in connecting uh, these devices, uh, but these devices um, aren't really. You know, a lot of seventy five percent of the data isn't used. Uh, that's the first thing. Um, and uh, monetization or return on on, on investment. Uh, isn't as high as it could have been or, or in line with expectations. Um, and, and why is that? It's because essentially the models have been siloed models, right? So it's been, okay, I'll put my devices on the platform, I'll connect them and I'll take the data and I'll use it. Another company will put their devices on the platform, they'll connect them, they'll use the data. Um, but there's been no interoperability, right? So, so, so you have siloed connected, connected devices, siloed data, uh, siloed use. Um, and the economy of things was was looking at okay, yeah, you know, can we have a you know uh, a position where you know a street light can sell sell send data sell data to a, a mobile camera or could you have a camera selling data to a drone or or a car selling data to a car park uh, and 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 could they do that across organizations? Could we break the silos? Could we make it interoperability? Could we make them trust each other? Um, and that is really the economy of things. It's about okay, you know, what what is going to be the biggest currency in the world going forward? So it's going to be data, right? Uh, the metaverse will need data. There's going to be an explosion of demand for data going into LLMs, uh, AI LLMs, because that needs data, right? Yeah, you know, we we we've got this false impression that AI happened overnight. They've been training those open AI models for years. <laughs> and it'll only be as good as the data that goes in there, right? So on the one hand, you have a load of IoT devices that are producing data. On the other hand, you've got demand for data and you can't bridge them, right? The economy of things is um, basically opening up devices so that they're interoperable, right? So what does that mean? It means that two devices that are from different owners, different parts of the ecosystem, can identify each other and trust each other. Why? Because they've got an interoperable digital identity, as you do in Web3, right? And uh, and how do you authenticate it? You have verifiable credentials and you have cryptography and a digital signature. And if you're going to do all that and, and my device can communicate with your device uh, and I've got data you want, then then I want to be able to transact it. So um, part of what we, we looked at was, okay, um, we can connect the devices uh, we can make we can provide an interoperable identity. We can have verifiable credentials, but actually, can we put a wallet on the device? Can we attach a payment credential, and can we link that to a smart contract so we can automate payments for different things? And and that is it, right? And, and we believe that those uh, that set of capabilities uh, opens up a whole economy of services and data, um, yeah, you know, for these billions of devices that are out there, right? Providing new monetization uh, opportunities. Some of the things you think about are fleets, right? If you look at big fleets, uh, you know, that are on the road, uh, if they've got a dash cam, could that data at a specific point in time be sold to an insurance company? Um, if you look at, uh, yeah, you know, all the supply chain problems we've had, how many of you have seen uh, Amazon trucks come to your house, uh, so to my house, it, the parcels are never for me, but I'll have three or four deliveries in a day uh, from the same Amazon, right? And they'll go back empty. You'll see them come back. They'll start out full. They'll go back empty. You know, what about if you could sell data on the capacity uh, of, of, of those vans or those trucks and sell the spare capacity, right? So they, they come full and they go back full. Um, you know, and you have other sort of opportunities where, you know, data in near real time uh, can make a difference, right? And, and that can be sold and that can lead to services. So, so that's what we've done with the digital asset broker, um, which is essentially 
more specifically to um, to build into the SIM card. So we're starting with SIM cellular devices uh, to begin with, but it will extend to others. Yes, uh, SIM card is as in the, the card that goes into the, the SIM card and the phone. That's what we're, we're we're, Yeah, very various forms. So you have SIM cards that go into the phone. You've got the uh, eSIMs, which are, are sort of woven into the device, and you've got... Or, or uh, any connected device, rather. Any, any, any connected device, yeah. Um, but but what we've done is we, we, we've linked that to, um, to, to, to blockchain. We've, we, we've got the ability to uh, generate cryptographic keys um, and attach that to, to, to the SIM and the device in the SIM. And essentially, um, what you're able to do with that is to allow the device to externally sign on chain, right? So all of a sudden, the device is able to sign, uh, it's able to access smart contracts, uh, it's able to access payment credentials, it's, it's able to execute, uh, it's able to look up and, uh, and verify identities and the credentials of identities of different devices. And that's basically what we've done. Um, and, and we've, we've built, uh, I, I think, the biggest economy of things platform or, or one of the biggest web three based platforms in terms of ecosystem because we've we've then enabled 160 million devices that uh, we have on the Vodafone IoT platform uh, with, with with the DAB capability or the economy of things capability uh, so you so it's a ready-made ecosystem uh, which we're now extending beyond um, so that's essentially what we've been doing but web three is the glue right web three uh, is the glue that, uh, that 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 allows the devices to trust each other, that allows them to um, you know to to to, to uh, essentially access smart contracts for automation, um, you know that 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 facilitates the verifiable credentials, and that allows it to scale because it's a decentralized model, right? So it's not a, a centralized model. Uh, so that, that that that's what we've been doing, and we believe that there's a bridge to the future world. Uh, so we believe that there will be a metaverse of things. Uh, so so we believe that the data from IoT devices and the link to uh, of, of of digital twins of devices in the industrial metaverse uh, will be pretty big. Uh, but also we're seeing now that you know billions of devices uh, across the world in different scenarios being used for different things. What better source of information coming going into AI uh, large language models? Um, and we want to now in the future connect um, the the data coming from devices and allow that to be sold real time uh, to to LLMs. Now, um, how um, how much progress has been made? I'll, and I'll use this as an example. I, I heard you talk about this use case on, on a on a on a podcast you had on a fairly popular podcast you were a guest speaker on where um and it's two scenarios right either you know a person owning a car or it could be a corporation owning a fleet of cars right electric cars that they need charging and um and and so there has to be a commerce between like the car and the charging station right uh, and and the, that's where you know i, I guess um um, you know, the, the, the Web3 will, will, will come into uh, the picture where um, that can happen seamlessly, right? So that use case I thought was very fascinating, right? So because imagine this, right? Like, um, especially in the, in the scenario of the fleet of cars, you know, hundreds of cars in a fleet and, you know, daily these need to be charged or sometimes more than once a day. Um, there's so much of, you know, transactions happening can that could potentially all be made seamless? Now, for a use case like that, is that already you know can can that already happen today, or we're we talking in the very near future? No, no. So, so, so one beauty of the digital asset broker platform, uh, and what we're really proud of, is that we've taken it from an idea, uh, from proof of concept through to MVP, but it's actually live. So we launched uh, the digital asset broker platform. is launched by our past CEO, of Vodafone, at, at the uh, at the Mobile World Congress in Barcelona in February 2021. Uh, and, and, and we've been uh, sort of pushing it ever since. Uh, we launched EV charging uh, last year, uh, live in the UK. We're now extending that across uh, Europe. Um, and, and it's live. And, and it's a great example of what I said before, which are devices having identity. Uh, in this case, cars having identities. Uh, these are individual cars or fleet cars. Or OEM, uh, you know, auto manufacturer cars, and then uh, communicating with another device, uh, which are the chargers, right? Um, and you have chargers with an identity, cars with an identity, 
Um, and and what's what's even even more exciting is that if you look at the identity quadrant or, or, or triangular uh, triangle, you have people, business, and things. Right? Um, you know, you got you always have people, business, and things. A device cannot exist on its own. It has to be. It has to have a direct, derived identity of a business or or a person. Uh, but in this case, you have a device which is a connected car, a device which is a charger, and and we can also link that to the identity of the person driving it right uh, uh, so if you think about um, you mentioned fleets um, what what's important for um, fleets to know is you know and, and, and in Europe you have fleet cards so so what will happen is uh, fleet companies will issue cards or payment means to to, to the drivers uh, and where you have a temporary driver maybe they'll pay by themselves and claim it back but you've got a huge um, industry managing drivers and their payment credentials and then you're looking at fraud you're looking at authentication you're looking on but it, essentially what we're able to do here is say okay uh, mr fleet company you can um, have you know an identity for all your vehicles and you can put a payment credential linked to the identity of your vehicle. So you put the you attach the wallet and the payment credential to, to, to the vehicle. And you can then authenticate different drivers, uh, different fleet drivers, temporary, whatever, uh, to, to that vehicle and authenticate them to use that one payment credential in the vehicle. So you've got many drivers who can use one payment credential. Uh, so so that makes that simplifies the model for the for the fleets. Um, but then the uh, the link of the digital asset broker identities and wallets and transactions and smart contracts uh, makes the actual transaction itself simple, right, uh, and seamless. Now, Tesla are able to do this because, um, you know, the car is Tesla, the driver is Tesla, the chargers are Tesla. So they have a closed loop system. Uh, but what we're able to do with Web3 is allow uh, different auto manufacturers, different fleets, different charging companies across uh, and different people uh, to all trust each other using Web3. Uh, so you have the same experience as you would with Tesla uh, because uh, blockchain and Web3 is providing uh, the trust and the smart contracts and the, and the payment mechanisms. Uh, so that's actually live. Uh, and and we're, we're looking to essentially have 90 plus, over 90% coverage uh, of charging stations across Europe. Uh, and we are in discussions now uh, for, for the U.S. Um, there's been some, obviously, some announcements with Tesla and some of the big uh, auto manufacturers in the U.S. Uh, recently. Uh, but we believe we have a solution which, um, which can bring together the ecosystem and, and, and uh, facilitate peer-to-peer -peer, uh, transactions and agreements. This, this is beautiful. So I think this is the this is exact example of that creating that real world utility right if i go back attending conferences two three years ago the whole thing was like hey we need to see utility and i think now this is coming to fruition which is great for the industry right now you you work for a very big um you know uh, name in in the in the mobile phone business um i want to get your thoughts on does the mobile phone actually have a future or is this going to die in a few years and it, we'll all be wearing glasses, right? What what will the future look like? You know, three three four years from now. Right? Yeah, I, I can give you my 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 opinion. So so I you know I, I do a number of presentations on the metaverse, and you'll see um, there's one slide I present where you know you start off with the eight million smartphone eight billion smartphones, and then you start seeing the smartphone with the glasses, uh, which is kind of what Apple presented, um, and then you start just seeing the glasses. Uh, um, so, so I think you'll have convergence of of access, uh, you know, of access devices. But we've got to be realistic. There's eight billion smartphones in the world. It's taken us a long time to get that level of penetration, and a lot of the use cases that we have, a lot of the user journeys and experiences, and everything we do is app based and it's based on the phone. Uh, so I don't see the phone going uh, going anywhere soon. I think there's some developments that need to happen with the glasses. Uh, so, so at the moment, uh, you have two ways of um, content being delivered, right? Uh, two main ways. You have streaming. Um, and with streaming, you need less hardware. You need less bulky devices because it's, it's about buffering, et cetera. And then you have, um, then you have downloading and, and, and the way you need memory. And I think at the moment, um, you know, the, 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 the devices that we use to access the metaverse are, are sort of bulky devices that that have memory and, and that uh, have a lot of hardware. I think as we move to streaming, and then we will need to do that, uh, then the glasses become thinner. Um, 
and and I think that's the point at which uh, you'll you'll start to see more convergence with the with the mobile phone um, as we get more used to the the metaverse space and that, and interacting with content through the metaverse. But I think for now, uh, the glasses will be there and 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 uh, and they'll coexist with the smartphone. Um, and, and we will need that. Uh, so, 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 what, what will be important is that the that we that people are able to access metaverse content and to participate in metaverse communities via the mobile. Right. Uh, um, I think you know if we look at some of the forecasts for metaverse opportunity, which everybody's backing out from now, but I'm gonna I'm gonna hold them to it anyway. Uh, but you you had um, you know McKinsey, for example, that forecast uh, back in 2022. You know, the metaverse opportunity would be worth five US five trillion. We had uh, City uh, come up with something yeah in the trillions, and I think now they're they're, they're sort of moving away from that. But even if it's one trillion, right? That's one percent roughly of global GDP. That's not people at home with a set of glasses, right? That's people driving their vans, people at work, people in different uh, circumstances. So, 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 so I, I don't see everybody, uh, you know, in the workspace or whatever, walking around with the big glasses, right? It's got, you know, you've got to be able to access it on the move, um, and uh, I, I think you know it's going to be important to be able to access via the mobile phone. And I think the mobile phones will become more three D ready. Uh, and 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 then they'll they'll be able to interact with different glasses, um, you know, in the in the medium to short to medium term. But I think in the long term, you'll see a convergence uh, where where maybe it's just you know another access device and which will eventually replace the mobile. Right, but I guess so. I think right now, if you you know, watches are very popular. People wear the 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 the, the AirPods, right, or or you know, sim similar brands. So it, the compute will still be on the device, but I think this will be just another accessory. With a yeah, lot yeah, that, that, that's the way it's going now. It becomes another wearable, right? So that's definitely how Apple have approached it. It becomes another wearable, and you'll link it with your headphones, and you'll link it with your phone. And uh, yeah, that, that, that. but long term, um, I, th I think that the potential of the metaverse as a point of interaction, as a new web browser, as the point of interacting with content and people and communities is so profound. Uh, that it will be a replacement. But that, of course, this will take time. Super. Now, uh, uh, to our guests uh, today, um, we um, will start taking, you know, a few questions in, you know, in, in about five or 10 minutes, you know. So we'll be happy to take a few questions. So if you have anything, you can, you know, put it on the chat. Um, David, I wanted to talk about NFTs for a couple of minutes, right? So when we talk about, you know, Metaverse, Web3, NFTs already, you know, it come up. Uh, Starbucks is doing some cool things with NFTs and creating loyalty points. Uh, Nike is doing a lot with NFTs, right? Um, I, I think they, 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 a lot of the, the shoes, both high end and mm. uh, different price points. Uh, you know, they, they, there's NFTs there. Um, I think they even sold a shoe for twenty dollars. <laughs> a lot of the popular models. Um, what are your thoughts on NFTs and you know within the enterprise, right? Are there any any is is that a big thing for you folks and are you doing anything with, with NFTs? Um, so I think there was an announcement. Uh, so, so, so there's two major things that uh, you, you'll find uh, in terms of NFTs that, that, that we've been associated with. Uh, one, one was uh, selling the first uh, SMS that was sent, sent as an NFT. Um, and I think that happened in 2021, uh, December 2021, or maybe January 2022. And then the next one was, um, was recently an announcement that we were going to use Polygon and we were going to, uh, issue at NFTs. Um, I, I think if you look at NFTs, they're, they're very, very exciting. Um, I think they're exciting for a number of reasons um, because they represent digital ownership, uh, but they're getting more sophisticated, right? So if you look at um, you know what NFTs can do, um, you know there's a number of uh, you know there's a number of things they can do, um, you know, which, which, which are really exciting. Uh, I, I think some of the, um, if you look at some of the new standards that are coming out, um, you know, you have time bound NFTs, right? So, 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 uh, you know, you had, uh, NFTs, which, which are non fungible and they represent, own, they represented ownership of the asset. And now we're seeing the emergence of time bound NFTs where essentially that asset could be rented out. It could be leased out. It could be a temporary ownership that you transfer. Uh, recently, we, 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 we've also seen uh, royal, loyalty or royalty NFTs, where essentially, if you create an asset, um, you, you, you know, be it a service or a software or whatever, 
you know, every time that asset uh, is sold or exchanged, you can get a royalty from it, right? So that that's another cool thing. Uh, and then recently, you're seeing smart contracts come out where essentially you can, um, you know, either lock that NFT in for finance. Uh, so you have a, a house that is, uh, you know, becomes an NFT, you can lock it in and you can get finance on it as you can with, digi- with, with other digital native assets. Um, and, and then you've got other NFTs where you can bundle it into, uh, you can bundle NFTs in with other tokens. So, um, you know, fractionalized tokens or ERC-20 tokens in Ethereum language. Um, so I think NFTs um, you know, are going to be a very, very big part of uh, the token economy. I think they'll be a very big part of the economy. Uh, again, you know, they were at the top of the hype cycle in 2021. Um, it's gone quiet. But I think you'll find that in industry, uh, there's a number of, we're only beginning to see what can be done with them. You know, can you make an NFT um, you know, the, the the token of ownership, represent ownership in a car, right? Can that then allow you to have a digital copy of it? You know, uh, can the NFT then, if you have a, a car which is, uh, you know, you know, the ownership is represented by an NFT, does the NFT become the point of sale, right? So you sell the digital version, you get the real version. Um, you know, will, will you have NFT mortgages? Will you have NFT credit default swaps? Will you have N- NFT hedge funds. I mean, the, the, the potential of NFTs, as I said, we're only beginning to see uh, to see them. So I'm really excited about them. Uh, I think there's, uh, you know, uh, in terms of digital asset broker, you know, we would look at uh, NFT, uh, you know, issuing NFTs uh, for every IoT device that we register on there, right? So so that, uh, you know, that that, 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 it, that represents the digital ownership in, in both sides and, and, and could be the basis for, for transaction, uh, you know, the, the means of transacting those assets going forward. And I, you know, I, when I look at all of this, um, it, it, you know, regardless of, you know, where the use cases happen, et cetera, right? Um, with, you know, everything is happening with, with Web3 Metaverse, um, I think 5G being the underlying, you know, all this massive sharing of data, uh, it, 5G makes it so much of easier. So I, I think a lot of the, the you know, the, the wood of phones of the world will be the ultimate one I'm thinking because at the end of the day, you'll, you'll provide that 5G connectivity, right? I, I think it's a great time. Yeah, I mean, most of the technologies you look at need connectivity, cloud, um, metaverse, AI, Web3, Web2. I mean, they, they're all, you know, the, the connectivity is is underneath all of them, right? And uh, connectivity is needing to evolve. Uh, so I think 5G is one of those evolutions or improvements we have. But there's other things, network slicing, uh, aggregation. Uh, there's a number of things that, that, that are on the way to, to make, um, you know, that connectivity more efficient. Um, but 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 it is the basis of, of everything. You can't have a metaverse without connectivity. You can't have autonomous cars without connectivity. Um, you can't have a, AI without connectivity. Especially where we're talking about going with AI, which is real time, right? Uh, you're talking about AI workers and AI digital assistants, and you know they've got to be able to act real time. And when, when you start getting to that goal, which is a way off, but when you start, you know, then, then you need um, you, you need some super fast, consistent low latency connectivity. Um, my final question before I'll start taking some Q&A, uh, David. Um, now, when, when, when this exchange of value between devices, right, does it still make sense for the, for the fiat currencies to be the, 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 the you know, for, the, for that value to happen? Or does it make sense, will it be more efficient if these machines are buying and selling data or the, the exchange of value is through a cryptocurrency, right? Or a digital asset, or or will we see a hybrid approach? Right. Um, re- really good question. Um, so, I, I think if we look at the original use case for Bitcoin and others, it was as a medium of exchange. Right. It was. It was okay. I I, I can use. And we had the famous um, yeah, story of the Bitcoin pizza. Right. The guy who paid the Bitcoin his pizza with Bitcoin, and it's God knows how many millions is. Or it's, it's yeah, that 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 would be worth now. Um, but it's the hundreds of millions. Um, but but it didn't work as a. It hasn't worked so far as a, a medium of exchange, right? Yeah, using tokens to pay for things because essentially what you're doing is you're going from a token uh, to a fiat, and and you've got this massive exchange with two systems that don't that haven't so far worked well together. 
Um, the other, the other um, thing that's been really negative with uh, you know tokens as um, you know crypto as a, a medium of exchange has been the gas fees, right? And the variation in the gas fees, and the time to finality, and some of these other issues we've had, you know, low TPS making that finality really hard. Um, of course, one of the big stories in Web3 and blockchain has been layer twos, right? And, and layer twos, you know, ZK rollups, um, optimistic rollups, uh, you know, uh, yeah, yeah. The, 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 these things are, are making, um, you know, the, the transaction costs or the, 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 the unit cost of transactions go down. Uh, we're also seeing some pragmatism in terms of what can be done on chain and what can be done off chain. Um, so, I, so I think things are, are getting better. Um, but I, I also think that the fintech and banking world are also coming to the party. Uh, so, so one of the partners we work with, Mastercard, recently um, introduced something called tokenized deposits. So you've got the Mastercard token network, and essentially what that's doing is allowing, potentially allowing users to take money uh, directly out of their bank accounts uh, and uh, and and uh, and. Uh, Move it into tokens, so acting as a stable coin, but without having the inter inter intermediary of my money. I buy a stable coin. You know, the, the money in your bank is a stable coin <laughs> in whatever denomination. So that is potentially pretty big, right? And that could that that, that could lower the barriers between um, you know between tokens and 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 uh, fiat money. Uh, but there's another way to look at it, right? So that's where you're going from fiat to tokens. But the other way you look at it is okay. Why are why are people going from tokens to fiat? Why why are we doing that? Right. Uh, part of it is that that's what people are charging in. But where you have exchange, which are which exchanges which are already allowing you to um, you know to, to 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 exchange tokens. Actually, if you look at um, exchanging tokens, the different tokens, why can't you just pay in tokens? You know, and, and and exchange one token for another. Why can't um, you know? Uh, you know, for example, um, you know, Vodafone pay for office space using a, a Vodafone token, and we work pay for connectivity using a WeWork token, right? Um, you know, that's where you have what I call digital barter, uh, which is essentially where you have tokens being ex uh, to tokens which have a a service value being exchanged for other tokens which have a service value and you don't need to go out of the token uh, economy and essentially uh, you know that that's something that hasn't been exploited it's always okay let's on ramp and off ramp but why why are you doing that for everything why do you need to do that uh, when you've got exchanges that are coming in uh, the, 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 that are there and you can exchange one token for another and i think the more uh, you know the the, the more vendors or you know uh, suppliers um, who, who are able to take token etc you know then, then maybe that could be a, a useful supplement to you know where, where things can be done from start to finish in tokens right and consumed in that way but but where you're going into fiat um, then then there have been barriers but I think the there's a lot of innovation in the banking and finance community um, which is trying to bridge that tokenized deposits being one of them this has been a riveting conversation, David. Um, now I want to you know, take a, a couple of questions from the audience. And this is a great question, and I'll just modify it a little bit. Uh, the question is around what, what do you think are some of the elements that can speed up the metaverse adoption? But before you address that, could you also tell me what are some of the challenges um, you know, that, you know, towards driving you know, more adoption? And then what, what can speed it up, right? Uh, so, so obviously the challenges to adoption are are the handsets, right? So I think there's um, there's two major things, right? The metaverse generally needs consistent, high speed, low latency connectivity, and what you'll find is that um, a lot of the countries um, that need it most, <laughs> who can benefit it most, don't have that kind of infrastructure, right? So there's got to be equality of connectivity, uh, and, that, and that's a challenge at the moment because generally. The rich countries, uh, you know, have the infrastructure. The poor ones don't. Um, so you could have a, a metaverse for the rich, which which isn't, you know, I, I think the the goal of it. And so I think that's a challenge. Um, I think another challenge is the price point uh, to enter. So so I think what you know, we were all excited about the Apple Pro uh, headset announcement, but then when we saw the price point, you know, yeah, yeah I, I think you know, professionals. 
you know, I would be the first to put my name down to buy the headset, right? Uh, but um, you know, if you're thinking of you're a poor person in African or Asian or another country, and you simply can't afford it, right? That's the year's wages or you know or earnings. So, 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 so you know, th th those are barriers. If you're going to get high scale adoption, uh, the cost of entry needs to be low. Uh, and the means to entry needs to be widespread, and I think at the moment those two things are are, are challenging. And um, I think one thing that was exciting and very smart about Apple's announcement was they they came with content. So straight away they said, right, you can get all these movies that you can watch on the headset. You've got you know everything on the App Store will be available on there. So it was, straight away there was content, and that's going to be a big uh, uh, carrot for people to be able to, to adopt is like, okay, I'm going to go on there because I can get this content or I can get, I can use all my content I've got, but I can get some new content. So I think those are our considerations. Uh, how do you meet those challenges? Um, I think you've got to put the boundaries low to begin with, right? So, so, so while, you know, some people can use some of the most sophisticated, uh, you know, uh, immersive VR uh, software and communities, I think you've got to start off really simple. Um, and you gotta you gotta make it accessible on a mobile phone. Eight eight million people, and you've got to make uh, it work with wallets, and you've got to make it work uh, with social media, because I think where you where you embedded in those things, and I think we're closer to that now, because yeah, you know, I, I believe what's happening naturally is we're moving away from building this infrastructure called the metaverse, which is this you know this all encompassing metaverse which sits alongside the real world. And I think a more pragmatic view now is you're going to have the meta metaverse, you'll have the Apple metaverse, you'll have you know other metaverses, uh, the Instagram metaverse and the Twitter metaverse, and eventually they'll come together. So that allows you to get quick adoption because it allows these platforms who have um, the ecosystem to quickly embed immersive experiences uh, and, and to get people familiar with it. And then, then they'll want to move that and port that across, which will start converging towards what you know, more of the ideal metaverse. Um, so I think those are two things, uh, price point, access devices, um, and um, in, you know, providing the incentives for, for existing Web3 internet and, and other platforms to embed it in their current solutions. And then, uh, so we spoke about the challenges and then any suggestions, you know, to, in terms of speeding up uh, the adoption? Uh, what advice would you give, you know, any of your peers, right, based on maybe some of the challenges you saw in your own organization, you know, getting, you know, buy-in from, you know, at the board yeah. level, the senior management level to, from that perspective, um, any any suggestions on what what are some of the things they could do yeah. to drive? So, 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 so in terms of the business metaverse, I think digital twins, um, you know, and, uh, and the industrial metaverse is doing pretty well. Um, in terms of the consumer metaverse, um, I, I think that, the, the, this exciting. Uh, one of the big things I'll say is don't try and sell a big bang. Right, it's not going to be a big bang. Uh, as, as I said, it's not going to be this. Uh, you know, you, you're going to uh, sit down one day and the next day you switch on and there's this metaverse and we all go into it. It's not going to. Uh, it's not going to arrive like that. So, 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 so part of the um, advice I would give is, is is pick an area of the metaverse that adds value. And the metaverse will not add value to every business. Right. It, again, you look at uh, the the. You know, Two, two key factors, uh, you know, the value added from removing, uh, so, so the benefits of removing geography, the value added from the levels of immersiveness. And clearly, uh, if you're a car mechanic, maybe the met, the industrial metaverse will, will help. But if you're selling hamburgers, maybe not, right? Uh, uh, you know, it, it depends. So you've got to find the right area where it adds value. And uh, and don't sell the big bang. And, and take, uh, take, take, take value added steps, you know, use it where it's going to add value. And I think that's where we're going with it now. Where does it add value? Education, yes. You know, um, uh, you know immersive 3D movies, yes. I, I, think, I, think, I think those are the sensible things. But then the other thing I would, I would say, and this is from being on the ground with it, is that the metaverse does not, it doesn't exist uh, in isolation, right? The metaverse works with AI, it works with Web3, it works with Web2. And the magic will be how you combine the metaverse or how the metaverse can combine these technologies to provide new businesses, new solutions, new opportunities. And I think one of the key ones where, where, where these two things really need each other is AI and the metaverse. I think they go together, right? AI needs a persona. You cannot interact with AI 
in isolation. If, if AI is going to replace 300 million jobs, uh, then it's going to replace people that we call, people that we interact with uh, physically. And how's, how's the AI, AI going to bridge the physicality and the environment? It's going to be metaverse. Um, and in the same way, the metaverse uh, needs the intelligence of AI uh, to bring personalized experiences, right? Um, so you look at these two things, and, and I think part of the magic of the metaverse is how you can then use it as a bridge to interact with these other technologies and give them personal, physical uh, interaction experiences. Um, and I think that that is the key to unlocking it. But once you realize that AI and the metaverse go together, AI and Web3 go together, AI and uh, Web2 go together, then you realize that the, the metaverse doesn't ex exist in isolation, but it's a complementary technology that, that actually brings all these things go together for our benefit, you know, the benefit of the customer experience and our convenience. And that, that then has more power than just we're moving to the metaverse. Super, and that, I'm so glad you addressed that. That was one of the questions I had on my list. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, should 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 uh, you know leaders like you, business lead, you know executives, leaders like you, driving blockchain projects, should you do the big bang, sell the big vision approach, or prove one use case, and you know, and, and start from there? So thank you for addressing that. Uh, we're almost done. I just want to take a quick pause here. I did see a question on real estate and NFTs. I, I want to share with the Hyperledger community that on August 22nd we are uh, hosting an event. Um, called Token Expo. It's in collaboration with Hyperledger and a few other entities in the ecosystem. We have a great lineup of speakers. We'll be covering use cases on real estate, capital markets, and supply chain, uh, and uh, many other areas. So it's a four-hour event, 9 a.m. California time, which I believe is 4 p.m. GMT. Uh, and um, uh, I, I, I believe David and some of the folks at, Hy uh, at Hyperledger will make those announcements very soon. So please try to join us on August 22nd. David, before we end, um, you didn't tell me the name of the book. You, you know, you, you mentioned you're writing a book. Ah. When is it available? When is you know where, where can we find it? And 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 what, what's the what's the uh, what's the title of the book, right? So, so the core, the book is called "The Business of the Metaverse," uh, and it's published by Kogan Page. And I will um, I, I will I will put a link uh, in the chat here. In fact, I'll try and do it now. Um, so, so yeah, re really excited. I put my heart into it. So, so yeah, I, I, I do come with, with, with maybe different viewpoints uh, from what you'd normally find. Um, but, um, yeah, I, I believe that it, it should add to the conversation. So I'm just going to look look it up uh, and, and I will put it on. Well, while, you, while you post the link, there was a couple of questions. Uh, yeah, I will... We will share the... Uh, the, the event is uh, Token Expo on the 22nd. Um, I'll work with David Boswell and, uh, like I said, the Hyperledger folks to, you know, to push that out to the Hyperledger community. It's uh, the 22nd, not the 26th. Um, in the meantime, we'll have David post the link of the book, if you can. Um, highly yeah, recommend I've got it. I've a got copy it. of the book. I'll post that now. I've got it. Perfect. So, David, thank you so much for your time. We are reaching the end of our hour. This was a fascinating conversation. I wish we had more time. Uh, but I'm hoping in the future we'll have you back join us for uh, a future event and uh, maybe even do an in-person event in London if that's possible and 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 uh, you know do something uh, you know in person uh, in the future. Um, with that, I want to turn it over to David Boswell, uh, folks. Uh, everybody, thank you for joining us. Um, uh, um, David, thank you so much. Um, I will definitely be in touch and I look forward to reading your book. Okay, yeah, uh, hopefully everybody got it. I posted it. I just posted it in the chat. So yes, hopefully everyone's, yeah, perfect. Good. Yeah, thanks for posting that, David. I'll also share it with everybody who signed up to the event. I'll, and I'll send a link to the recording too for everybody who signed up. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Thank everyone. You. Have a great rest thanks, of Tanvir, for organizing. My pleasure. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.